Joining us today is Dr. Deborah Anna Lutnitz. Dr. Lutnitz has been practicing psychoanalytic therapy with individuals and families for four decades in Philadelphia. For over 30 years, she was on the clinical faculty of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and is currently on the teaching faculty of the Institute for Relational Psychoanalysis of Philadelphia. In 2005, Dr. Lutnitz launched Insight for All, a pro bono program designed to connect analytic therapists with homeless and formerly homeless adults. She is the author of three books. The first was Child Custody, published in 1982, and then The Family Interpreted, Psychoanalysis, Feminism, and Family Therapy in 1992. Her latest book, Schopenhauer's Porcupines, Five Stories of Psychotherapy, has been translated into seven languages. She was also a contributing author to a contributing author to the Cambridge Companion to Lacan. I've asked her to speak today mainly about the ideas in Schopenhauer's Porcupines, this book here, which oh. was recently released as an audio book read by Dr. Lutnitz herself. We will get more into this in a bit, but first, Dr. Lutnitz, thank you so much for joining us here today. It's really nice to see you. My pleasure, Daniel. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, of course. Um, I would love for for us to get started, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in psychology in general? Sure, good question. So um, I think it began with um, my fascination and love for literature. Uh, and that goes back to probably high school days. Uh, it seemed to me that um, in reading the classics from Homer to uh, Sophocles and then Shakespeare and uh, Dickens and contemporary novelists um, like Toni Morrison that um, I was learning so much about human passions and desire and defeat and longing um, and faithfulness and meaning. And uh, I wanted to place myself in that world and also to do something in the way of healing. So psychology seemed to be the right choice. Mm -hmm. um, the word itself, as I'm sure you know, comes from the Greek words psyche and logos, study of the mind. So I thought uh, it would have to be fascinating. Now, I, it so happens that uh, I was the first person in my family to go to college. Okay. And um, uh, in fact, well, in fact, my father only went to seventh grade, so he didn't even start. He didn't even go to high school. So the advantage of being the first in your family is that there's a lot of excitement, a lot of loving support, mm. you know, and hopes and expectations. You know, finally, one of ours is <laughs> going to start this journey. The downside is that you don't know uh, what you don't know about choosing a college and selecting a major. So I think in a way that choice of psychology was, uh, was a big mistake in some ways because it is not study of the mind. Uh, at least it wasn't. I should really speak from my experience because I have lots of psychologist friends who absolutely loved their, uh, their studies. And, uh, but in, um, we're talking about 1970 in the Midwest mm. where I was in school at uh, Kent State University in Ohio. Um, hmm. psychology, as in much of America, was study of behavior, hmm. not the mind, behavior, and uh, not even always human behavior, <laughs> 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 alas. So, uh, so whereas in my high school, um, we were uh, talking about meaning in all my classes, and also still did that in college in my wonderful English classes and philosophy and science classes, they, they were great class courses. But in my major, we were, we called it rats and stats. Mm. It wasn't just research and empirical, which can uh -huh. be tough enough, but it was very much, you know, experimental uh, animals. In fact, my, um, my first job in college was cleaning the rat cages for Professor Ben Newberry. <laughs> So, and what, uh, and I was so confused, you know, I had been to this very rigorous, wonderful Catholic school in Cleveland, where uh, we, it seemed to me the nuns were brilliant scholars. I mean, I was so very, um, I just loved high school. Um, and here I felt uh, really baffled that nothing 
interesting was going on. By the way, a scientist um, in, in adulthood has told me that that psych research was so bad, it really never told us even anything about animals, about rats or, or monkeys. Oh. Uh, let alone human behavior, right? Huh. So now imagine how, you know, uh, that sort of um, painful that was for me after there were these great expectations for my family yeah. <clears throat> to have to tell them, uh, I haven't learned anything yet in <laughs> <laughs> psychology. <laughs> and my professors don't seem very smart or articulate or any, uh -huh. you know, I uh, was just abominable. I, can't, I couldn't know what I was actually experiencing. It was depressing. Hmm. So the way I um, resolved it was, unfortunately, to say, oh, I know, I bet in graduate school, that's where it gets interesting. So I'm going to get a PhD. Now, you know, in fairness, nobody promised me that. <clears throat> that was just my fantasy, my wishful thinking. So off I went to a program in clinical psychology. There was no PsyD at the time. That might have helped me. Okay. I just went to a PhD program in clinical, and um, it was slightly better. But uh, it was still very experimental, and we weren't grappling with the issues that I felt uh, were so important. And mm. I kind of fell into a slump, you know, it was, yeah. it was pretty emotionally rough. Yeah. Um, couldn't quite believe it, you know. So um, anyway, what, what finally helped me out of it was, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to put down the University of Buffalo because it was, the professors were wonderful. It was all white men, of course. Oh. at the time um but uh but they really cared about all the students women and men they wanted us to succeed they were very supportive it's just that the content was you know psychoanalysis had been all all but banished and um uh so what happened was my partner at the time was also a graduate student but in the english department and he said to me uh pretty early on wait a minute how come i'm reading freud and you're not, <laughs> and you're the one in psychology. Huh. So I just told him what I had been taught and said, oh, because Freud was not scientific. Huh. And so he has nothing to tell us. Uh -huh. And besides, um, um, he only cared about rich people. And besides, he hated women. So mm -hmm. why would we even bother, right? So my boyfriend luckily said, yeah, you might want to, <laughs> you're a smart girl. Why don't you read a little bit? Mm. and uh, and then make up your own mind. Mm. So that was fair enough. So I read The Interpretation of Dreams, and that really changed oh. my mind. Yeah. yeah. So um, And Freud called that, by the way, his best and most important book. I still teach from it to this mm. day. Oh, cool. And um, so, yeah. So then it turned out that at, this is just a stroke of luck, that at the university there in Buffalo, there was a center for psychoanalysis and literature. Oh. And although I couldn't take course credits there, you know, what's going to help me get my degree, I could hang out there, you know, and, yeah. uh, and be nourished. So I audited classes, and that's where I first read Freud um, in a big way. And Melanie Klein and Donald Winnicott and this interesting French analyst named Jacques Lacan. And that was oh. 1976. So uh, to this day, American analysts are just getting interested in French psychoanalysis. But... Um, but back there, it was it was pretty cutting edge, huh? pretty yeah. avant-garde. So I realized, um, to my chagrin, I really wished that somehow I had been able to just real, you know, realize straight away that psychoanalysis was what I wanted, not psychology. But there we were, had to uh, had to wrap things up. So I did a dissertation that had to do with um, the family. Now, a lot of students, I don't know how you folks feel these days, what, what the buzz is about dissertation topics, but a lot of my cohort was saying, oh, you just do something quick and dirty, just yeah. whatever is the fastest thing to get, you know, just to get your ticket punched, and then you go live your life and do uh -huh. something interesting. I don't know, that's just not me. It wasn't mm -hmm. then and it, and it isn't now, because I realized it was going to take a long time to do any, there's no such thing as quick, dirty maybe, but not quick. <laughs> So it better be something that I could, I cared about, a question that was important. And at the time, um, something that was in the news a lot was the divorce rate, which was very high. Uh -huh. And um, uh, from the beginning of time, men had custody of children, if anything happened to the mom. And then for about 50, 60 years, women had custody in, in, the, in Western cultures. Mm. It was, there was a presumption for the mother and then with the women's movement, gender roles changing, there was again a sense of maybe men could 
maybe men can mother and maybe in some cases children are better off with the father. Then there was this brand new thing called joint custody where after a divorce, there isn't a major and minor parent. Mm. And so mom being the one with uh-huh. all the responsibility and dad being kind of the, you know, the weekend visitor who uh-huh. dates the children on, on the weekends. Um, what if they both continue to have responsibility for the kids? Well, it was controversial because, well, what if the parents can't get along, then the kids will never be free. So I decided that would be my dissertation topic. And I got 50 families to agree to being interviewed. And I had to give them all kinds of crazy paper and pencil tests. So there would be data. Uh And, uh, and I, you know, um, drew some conclusions about when joint custody can work and not and that sort of thing. So Um, and I was very lucky that my professors were willing to let me do something they described as more anthropological than mm. strict, um, you know, empirical. Uh-huh. And although, believe me, I did a lot of chi-squares and analysis of variance, you know, st- yeah. statistics were performed. Um, and they thought that the, the final product was good and that it should be a book. And they were right. So wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to publish it. Yeah. Wow. as uh, by Lexington books called uh, child custody. And, um, and apparently uh, a lot of, because it was the first study of its kind, I think it got picked up and a lot of people, um, lawyers and judges were, uh, you know, took it into consideration when they were making um, their decisions. So, oh. um, uh, so having focused on the family in my research, I thought it really would be good to, complement that by doing a, a fellowship in family therapy. That's how I got from one to the other. So psychoanalysis had to be bracketed for a while. So that's how I got to Philadelphia. I left um, Buffalo to come to Philly, allegedly for one year to study with the great Dr. Salvador Mnuchin, because it was here in Philly that family therapy was born, or let's say it's one of the centers of origin for mm-hmm. the movement. And uh, here I am, uh, 40 years later. Um, and uh, anyway, that was um, uh, certainly a fascinating experience. I liked yeah. very much being a family therapist, but uh, uh, it did become clear watching various practitioners work that the family therapists who had psychoanalytic training hmm. were doing a different kind of work. And the ones that there was family therapists were doing something a bit more superficial, just, you know, rearranging chairs, getting people to communicate better. And sometimes, you know, that's all a a healthy family may need, but the quick fix doesn't work for everybody. And so the ones who had some training in adept psychology were doing actual healing Mm. rather than just fixing. Mm. And once again, I came to grips with the idea. I, after all this education, now I'm really <laughs> just getting started. And it takes a long time and it's expensive, but I, um, I did start my psychoanalytic training. Oh. So, um, and, uh, and that, you know, it was, it was wonderful. I've been practicing in a psychoanalytic way ever since. Okay. Um, that's a long answer to a yeah. short question. No, there's so, uh, so much interesting stuff. So I'm from Ohio. I don't know if you know that. Yeah. I don't. Where? Yeah. Um, I'm from Ohio, uh, and you know, where, 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 so Southern Ohio is a small town called Hillsboro. It's an hour from Dayton, hour from Columbus, um, okay. Amish country. Yeah. Amish country. Yeah. Um, and so, okay. So you mentioned your love for literature and reading, reading Homer and reading awe. And it reminded me there was, um, I was reading a, one of the books I read by Dr. Nancy McWilliams. She was saying that the, someone wrote a letter to Anna Freud asking what they should do in preparation to becoming a psychoanalyst. And her advice was basically read literature. Well, what was one of the main things that was read literature for like the poets and the authors and all of these different stories will have much more to tell you and than you can even imagine. And, and so I, I've always tried to make it a... a a goal to be well read. And so I really, that's really, I, I very much resonate with your feeling of, you know, you, you want to get this education and this thirst for knowledge and, and you go to school and it's a disappointment. And then you find this, this small section of psycho psychoanalysis and literature. And that just like brought tears to my eyes. That's, oh. <laughs> that's a dream. 
Um, oh, I like, can I comment? Um, yeah. Uh, Anna Freud uh, learned that from a very good source, okay? Okay. <laughs> Her dad. Um, yeah. He oh. wrote a little book, now I'm going to recommend, that okay. um, where he said the worst possible training for a psychoanalyst would be medical school. Mm. And not because he didn't like medicine. He was a doctor. He liked being a doctor. But he said for the kind of work that an analyst does, mm. that kind of linear thinking that mm. you need to do as a physician, is it this symptom or this? Is it the differential that you do uh -huh. um, is not helpful. You need a, a different kind of horizontal thinking. Mm. Um, and you need, and, and so he said the best preparation would be the humanities, literature, uh, art history, life languages, religious studies, um, anthropology, those, that would be the background. And he himself was extremely well read. I mean, he knew, I think he had read every Shakespeare play and was always, always quoting Shakespeare. Yeah. And, and I think he did read him in English because Freud was, Freud's English was not bad at all. Mm. Um, and he had, he had several languages as Europeans tend to do. Uh -huh. But um, he wrote a little book called The Question of Lay Analysis. And it sat, and indeed he was trying to respond to this, um, feeling that only and that, that you needed to go to medical school before you could become an analyst. And so he's saying, absolutely not. It's the opposite. Uh -huh. And, um, but in writing that little argument, he, it just so happens that he summarizes all the important ideas of psychoanalysis. So when people say, what should, if I want to read Freud, where shall I start? that's actually the place and okay. i wish it had a different title because it sounds like it's going to be about something very specific but so they read something like the case of dora and that's the worst place you could start or introduction to psychoanalysis but that's or oh a lot of uh, high schools actually will um assign civilization's discontents that's a very mm. messy book huh. you start with uh this little thing called 1926 called um, the question of lay analysis and you get a really nice um outline or, or introductions it's very intimate and smart but Good. yeah um the, the humanities that's yeah you know. and well so i've never heard i have a few books by freud but i've never heard of that one so thank you i will i will look that one up and you also before we started briefly mentioned freud and jesus is it okay if you go in and tell us a little bit <laughs> about that Absolutely. yeah <laughs> so i was in ireland um, five or six years ago and asking uh, an Irish analyst friend how um, about the history of the field in Ireland, which obviously has been a very Catholic country. And he huh. said that the first psychoanalyst in Ireland was a guy named Jonathan Hanrahan. Hmm. Yeah. And, um, and that he was a Catholic priest. Um, and I said, that's a bit unusual. And he yeah. said, yes, well, I think he knew that if anybody was going to introduce psychoanalysis to Ireland, it better be <laughs> a Catholic priest, you know, because uh -huh. only he would have the uh, credibility. Uh -huh. um, and that he furthermore had actually written a book called Freud and Jesus. So uh, it's been out of print for ages, but I was able to, to get one of the first editions. And I was fascinated because I just assumed it would be one set of arguments and it's a very different set of arguments. So um, I have a friend who is a, a local friend who works with me with the homeless, who is a psychoanalyst and an ordained Lutheran priest. Okay. And we, uh, she was asked in her analytic training, so how do you reconcile mm. your interest in psychoanalysis with your faith? And uh -huh. she said, I, they complement each other. There's no, I don't yeah. feel the conflict. So uh, her, her professor, to, to his credit, said, you know, if you feel that way, you ought to write about it. That would be fascinating. Huh. And so um, I told her about the original Freud and Jesus. And we talk about writing, not a book, but an article where we huh. update it. So um, we just, you know, off yeah, the top, you very know, a little lighthearted about it. What do they have in common? They were both, um, both brilliant, both Jewish mm -hmm. men who were eloquent, who were persecuted for their beliefs who changed the world mm. Yeah. Mm. and at any hour of the day anywhere in the world somebody is talking about one of them yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes very true but there's more to it than that freud uh -huh. said in a uh, in a letter to carl jung psychoanalysis is in essence a cure through love mm. yeah. yeah yeah so that sounds very to me like um the, you know the jesus i know a cure through love however jonathan hanrahan um 
who, uh, who wrote the original Freud and Jesus did not focus on love. Wouldn't you think that? I, I thought that would be it. No. You know what he focuses on? That both psychoanalysis and Christianity, as Jesus taught it, are conflict models. So he quotes Luke 14, huh? Uh-huh. A man must hate his father. Yeah, leave husband and wife, mother and father, take up your cross and follow me. But yeah. the word hate, I've been told, is actually the word that's used in the uh, biblical Greek. Mm. Um, so, uh, so it's about conflict. Mm. And, and Freud is talking about it, all the conflicts in our mind and how we have to choose between uh, various wishes and our wishes and our yeah. fears. Anyway, enough about Freud and Jesus. I also don't feel a conflict. I mean, they're different. Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, that, pretty complex. Yeah. Okay. So after, after the Psychoanalytic Institute, um, where did you kind of begin your career at? Uh, at the uh, Philadelphia Child Guidance Clinic. Um, okay. This is so I did my one year of, uh, of um, family therapy postdoc, you know, just to finish the requirements for the degree. Uh-huh. Then I was all set and they, they had a position open and they hired me. So I was a family therapist in their inpatient unit for five years, I think. Okay. Boy, you learn a lot when you do inpatient. It's difficult, long <laughs> hours, but uh, yeah. Huh. So I learned a lot. And then um, in the process was doing my psychoanalytic training, you know, classes uh, in, in spur, in, in between. Okay. And okay. Um, so, um, and developed a, slowly developed a, a private practice, you know, sort of a mm. few patients at a time. Okay. And then I, um, one thing about family therapy is that it was very um, mother blaming, you know, mm. and I had come from graduate school where, um, you know, uh, as I say, I wasn't smitten with the coursework, but I felt that everybody was of goodwill and we were all trying to understand gender issues, not us against them, but together, women and men, everybody's, mm. come on, let's, let's see if we can't do this stuff better. Yeah. And um, uh, so everybody was in that way, a feminist, nobody was afraid of the word, but yeah. in family therapy, for some reason, it was kind of retro. And so our teacher, Salvador Mnuchin would walk in, we would watch these videotapes of him, where he would walk in and, and attack the mother. Mm. Uh, that's what it felt like. And, um, and, he, and he said, we just wanted to unbalance a, a rigid system and you have to push somewhere. You could push anywhere. Then why do you always push on the mother? Uh-huh. So when interviewed, he said, um, he used the word attack. He said, quote, attacking the mother is my preference. It is not a political statement. Wow. And I thought, wow, then what is a political yeah. statement? You know, uh-huh. so I mean, I thought, well, if, if what you're saying, sir, is that the only way <laughs> we can uh, do, if we can help families is to um, insult mothers, then just, then just say so. Okay, say uh-huh. that right out. Uh-huh. But if there are other ways, then why in the world aren't we doing something else? Uh-huh. So there is actually something called psychoanalytic family therapy. And okay. so I started taking seminars in Washington at the, um, uh, with David and Jill Sharp, who are wonderful experts on what they call object relations, family therapy. Uh-huh. And when you work that way, you don't have to blame anybody. You know, the, the, uh-huh. the answer was not to start blaming fathers to, to um, uh, disrupt a rigid system. Mm-hmm. It was to get everybody to start reflecting on their own behavior and to think for the parents, for example, to think about their own parents, what they mm. had appreciated, what had been hurtful. Do they want to con- perpetuate the pain of their own family of origin or was mm. it time to try something else? So, yeah, yeah that was, it was a big relief to be thinking along healing terms rather than um, always this kind of power dynamic of who's right and who's wrong. Mm. So yeah, so that's um, eventually I started seeing um, couples and families. Oh, I was going to tell you about um, the family interpreted because the um, family therapy seemed to be behind other aspects of culture. You know, it seemed like everybody was talking about gender in, uh. in the eighties and trying to, to change things um, in some way. And family therapy for some reason was, was a little behind in that mm-hmm. sense. So a few of us feminists, women and men, were writing articles and meeting at conferences to talking about how to do this stuff differently. And, um, and I eventually decided to write a book. Um, and that's, it was called the family interpreted psychoanalysis, feminism and family therapy. Uh-huh. And I didn't think I was, 
the ideal person to be writing the book because I was still too young, but somebody had to do it. And um, that was the most difficult book I've written of, mm. of my three. It was, uh, um, I guess, because I had to not just criticize the way things were being done. I went through each of the schools of family therapy. Sal, Sal Manucci is only one school, but there's Carl Whitaker's school and Murray Bowen's school. And they were all doing this one way or the other. They mm. were... Uh, they were devaluing women wow. and ignoring issues of gender and paying no attention to the fact that domestic violence in families was a bigger, a bigger problem than this, uh, than anorexia, which everybody was so fascinated with. Mm. So, um, uh, so I couldn't just criticize and say, you know, you all suck. <laughs> I had to propose an alternative, which uh -huh. is daunting when you're just starting out because you're trying to figure out what to say next. But I did offer then three long case examples for what a, um, a gender fair or mm. sensitive or feminist approach would be like uh -huh. um, with families. So it was that was wonderful. Yeah, um, uh, a lot of people um, were supportive, uh, you know, and helped me get through those rough years. And then um, uh, then I got a lot of requests for for therapy. Um, uh -huh. When, when the book came out, that always happens. Your phone rings a lot after. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's great. I, I I don't know if you've heard of Jordan Peterson or not, but what one of the things he says is to tell a better story, and so it sounds like that's exactly what you attempted to do, and that's good. Yeah. It, yeah. With um one of the I wanted to ask so with with those two books you mentioned, and then Schopenhauer's Porcupines, um which one was your favorite? Oh, that's a nice question. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I care about the, all three of them in, in different ways. Um, yeah. Child custody was, you always feel something special about you, that you're first. And, mm. and, um, <clears throat> and um, uh, but family interpreted, it felt, you know, kind of um, made a difference. A lot of people, uh, other students, graduate students wrote and said, we were having the same experience mm. where our teachers were landing on the mother or not seeing the father's pathology or, mm. you know, just assuming that, you know, it, it would happen where um, a male family therapist would congratulate the father for coming to the session, you know, thank him. Thank uh -huh. you for coming, sir. Nobody ever thanked a mother who had taken three buses with a little, a little kid on each arm for coming, uh, you know, just consider wow. that sort of uh. her burden. Anyway, so students are writing and saying, thank God. We, now we know we're not crazy. Mm. And, um, there's there's another way to do this kind of work and oh. i don't know to this day daniel i don't think family therapists go in and blame mothers <laughs> it wouldn't be tolerated the yeah. culture has changed enough yeah. Yeah. yeah so um and then but shabonar's porcupines was a pleasure to write it was just so much fun and the translations of course are are great and um all the books have been received warmly i'm so grateful and you know i've been invited to speak and i got to see the world um uh because of those invitations yeah wow yeah, yeah good 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 the um for the schopenhauer's porcupines for anyone who doesn't know what that reference um entails would you mind giving a very brief oh, sure. uh, why you titled it this yeah schopenhauer was a german philosopher in 19th century who uh had wrote a whole book of parables, kind of like, uh, you know, just we all know what parables are. So one, one of them is this, uh, a troop of porcupines is milling about on a cold winter's day and to keep from freezing, they huddle together for warmth. But just as they're uh, about to get, to feel a, a little uh, body warmth from each other, they notice they're hurting each other with the quills. So they spread out a little bit and then a little more and a little more. And finally, they're no longer entangled, but they're starting to shiver again. So they move closer and that cycle continues as they try endlessly to get a good balance between painful entanglement and death by freezing. <laughs> so, um, so Freud picked it up. I actually read it first in Freud okay. in a book called the group psychology and the analysis of the ego. And Freud said, you know, Schopenhauer got it just right. This is mm. the way it is for us humans. We're always trying to, we want both things. We want to have privacy but we also want to have fellowship and communion with others. We want religion, we want um, um, intimacy and sexual uh, union and fusion, but we also want a room of our own and uh, autonomy. And, you know, and 
and as human beings, we have different um, degrees of need for those things. So when you start a relationship with somebody, they may be more gregarious, more in need of others, uh, uh, or more solitary. And, and how do we manage that? So um, I found that it, a lot of people come to therapy feeling that there's something radically wrong with them, that sometimes they feel, um, as one woman said, I, I feel like um, when I get involved in a romantic relationship, I start to feel smothered and, mm. I, and um, I just long for time alone, just to be, do my own thing. But then when I'm on my own and not in a relationship, I start to feel lonely and um, I can't enjoy anything. And, and mm. so I'm really crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's something really wrong with me. And I, I, I told her the, the porcupine fable and she said, oh, that's so helpful. It's really oh. soothing, you know, kind of normalized it for her. Yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And very beautifully throughout this book, you, with each, with each um, case illustration, you have the five throughout it you it very much um does highlight that that dilemma with intimacy and the need for separation but also the need for union and um in one of the chapters and you so in throughout this book also you you're very real and genuine and it's as if um there's a lot of times that uh either through supervision or um talking amongst my peers uh, I just started seeing clients for the first time this past year. So only for like one year now. And sometimes you have thoughts or sometimes you run into problems and you hate to admit maybe a thought that came to mind, or you even hate to admit, maybe I dislike this client or something like that. Right. So those are very real thoughts. And you write about that in here. And, um, and one of the things uh, that that I found very funny in the book and very relatable is you're talking about maybe for different reasons, but you were talking about when you first started uh, charging for your services. And for us, um, at the standard fee where we worked at last year was forty dollars for a session. And I remember a lot of us were like, I don't know if I'm worth forty dollars. <laughs> and and that's a very real, I think, thought that a lot of us have. And um, and so you talk about how you practice saying over and over again, um, you know, my fee is $50. And then when it came time, you, you, you told your client that it was going to be $50 and she said, oh, great. That's, that's about what a dollar a week. And she mistook it as an annual fee. And that was so funny. I had to show my wife and she really appreciated it. Um, but can you kind of tell us your transition from, from, you know, you mentioned your supervisor right grace was she a supervisor uh -huh. yeah, grace. and then she even she even kind of seemed to transition at one point and she was kind of talking to you like right no okay um i might get it wrong but I, so in the book she was kind of giving you advice like now the times are changing we have to kind of start charging for our, our services am i wrong Oh, you're, uh, yeah, you're, con you're conflating two, uh, two things. So okay. <clears throat> it was Anne who was, uh, or oh, I don't know no. what I call her in the book. I might've changed her name, but she, oh. um, uh, yeah, I called her Fran in the book. I called okay, her Fran. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Fran, um, said to me, come on, you know, this is the eighties. Aren't wow. women allowed to make money? You don't have to, um, you can keep your good values, but still make a little, a few bucks given that, um, we were making, so we were working 60 hour weeks and our salary probably, it, it, um, it probably figured out to $8 an hour or something, you know, yeah. for people with PhDs and who are raising families and so on, it really wasn't much. So because the clinic could not increase our salaries, apparently they, they offered this new, um, group private practice. So uh -huh. they would give us private patients and you could charge whatever you wanted. But I said, I don't like that solution because I don't want to charge people huge amounts of money. Uh -huh. You know, I think you should just raise our salaries. So, yeah, it was Fran who said, uh -huh. come on, you know, and uh, and I was so into the people before profits thing. that I said, there's no way I'm going to charge anybody fifty dollars. That was mm. in the 80s. Um, that's just horrible. That's an obscene amount of money and I'm not doing it. Uh -huh. But then, you know how personal circumstances change. My apartment building was sold. My rent was doubled. Mm. 
and I had to do something. So I thought, well, maybe even one patient at the high rate, as long as this person could afford it, uh -huh. maybe I could manage. So you're absolutely right. I practiced in the mirror. My name is Dr. Lupnitz and my fee is $50. And I felt like a Martian, you know? Um, <laughs> and so the person arrived the first night, her name uh -huh. is Emily, or I call her Emily. And, um, uh, she got right into her. I mean, it, it was a rainy night and she had come in soaked like everybody else. And she actually looked more like I said, more like, um, even though uh, apparently the intake office had, uh, had the idea that she was a professional who worked in center city because of her address. Huh. Uh, but she looked more like a homeless person because she was sopping wet and her umbrella was broken. And so, but she gets right into talking about her relationship and some guy had dumped her and, and then at the end, when I, I said um, the fee is $50, she said, yeah, it's about a dollar a week, right? So no problem. Here you go. And she slapped <laughs> this $1 bill. It's all wet <laughs> on the table. And then I had to explain to her that actually no. And, uh, but, uh, and I could have then just taken her across the hallway and, and reassigned her. She would have been seen by somebody, huh. but not in the private, not in the group private practice. Yeah. Huh. Um, but I couldn't do it. I just wasn't ready <laughs> to make that jump. So I saw her for that tiny little fee for mm. quite a while. Wow. And uh, it was exhausting. Oh, because by the way, she was homeless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was, for example, homeless. That's why she looked mm. like that. So, um, uh, and it was the, she had given the address of the shelter, which happened to be in Center City. So people thought she was a lawyer or a doctor or something. Oh. Those buildings. Yeah. Nobody had, had tried to fool me. It was just a kind of clerical error. Yeah. 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 So, and, oh, and, and when, but they had told her $50 and she said, that's fine. I can manage it. So, um, so then just to keep myself sane, because Emily really had been traumatized in her life. And so she was calling me between sessions mm. as people will do when they have a trauma history. Uh -huh. And it was, uh, so instead of this easy breezy uh, foray into private enterprise where I was going to be on easy street, instead, this patient was the most demanding exhausting uh -huh. I'd ever experienced. Mm. And I knew I needed to take care of myself somehow. Mm. So I, decided to buy an hour of supervision with the best person in town. And oh. that was Grace Strauss. Yeah. Oh, so okay, I, I got you it. remembered got Fran it. who was trying to coach me. Come on, yeah. let's, uh, let's play hardball. We're, we're, you know, ladies of the eighties. Let's, you can do that. Yeah. But no, it was Grace Strauss who, uh, who I called and said, I'm losing it, Grace. I need mm. your help. Mm. So she said, come see me. And uh -huh. um, she gave me a reduced fee so that I could afford it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, Grace had been to full disclosure, why not had been my own therapist, my first therapist before oh, okay. I went psychoanalysis. Yeah. yeah. But she had a very psychodynamic mind. Uh, and so as very often happens, your, your therapist or analyst can end up doing some supervision for you uh, with, with you. If that, you know, if that's yeah. agreeable to everybody. So, yeah, so she knew me very, very well. And, uh, there was a, a bond between us and I wouldn't have managed without mm. Grace that way. So the book is dedicated to grace. You may have noticed. Yeah. Yeah. That's very Your beautiful. Memory, yeah. yeah. I, and I think even in the book, you mentioned that didn't she have surgery and then within a few days, she was still offering services from her bed or something. She was very resilient. Yeah. And I mm. assume that she would. Yeah. yeah, well, yeah. I didn't know until I read that. I didn't know that, um, that supervision was something that you paid for post schooling like if you if you if i was part, yeah i thought that was Can. interesting i didn't know that not everybody does but uh -huh. um very often you know i have people come to me now um since i've been you know out of schooling uh, mm -hmm. who will say i read your book and i just think i would learn a lot about my cases if i bought an hour of supervision for me mm -hmm. so if a person can afford it why not that's uh -huh. that's fine or they okay. say i'm really interested in winnicott or in jacques lacan i think if i work with you or in dreams they'll say i didn't mm -hmm. learn anything about the interpretation of dreams uh -huh. in my training can i have an hour of supervision with you every week or every other week just to learn a specific something and they stay for a year or two or ten you know so yeah. it, no, that's not something you're required to do, but it's yeah. a, it's a luxury that a lot of people will, uh, very useful luxury that people will give themselves. Yeah. That's very good to know. Very good. Um, and so, and I, I think it was, was it Pearl, uh, in the fifth chapter? 
Yeah. Um, you, you said several years later, she came back, you guys had a conversation and you mentioned to her that you were thinking of writing this book and you asked her permission to include her and she was enthusiastic about it. Um, can you tell me kind of what went into the decision of who you were going to include in the book and maybe why you chose them? Yeah, well, I, and when I feel that we've done really good work, uh -huh. um, it's, I have that idea, but, um, mm. you know, it's a big decision for a person and I, I try and anticipate who would say yes and who wouldn't. Uh -huh. And, uh, and I assure them that I will massively, uh, disguise the details so uh -huh. that, you know, if a friend happened to pick up the book, they wouldn't say, oh, look, there's Pearl, you know? Mm, yeah. Um, and so there's a whole art to, uh, mm. subtracting things and adding things so that really only, only the person herself or himself could, would know for sure who it is. Yeah. Okay. And then I was, I was just, just out of a curiosity, when you, you include quotations, maybe that the client said, or that you said during session and in the, in our training, everything's video and audio recorded at on campus our first year yeah. and so we can actually go back and, and listen and i was just so i was just thinking um did is that just your best guess or from your best memory uh, maybe what yeah what was said yeah okay. so originally yeah we did we also taped videotape especially family sessions you know okay um but now when i started psychoanalytic training i began or even before that um, I started to take notes and Freud always said, do not take notes in front of the patients, except for dreams, because there's no way you're going to be able to remember mm. a dream. They're so illogical. Mm. Um, but um, I, I don't do that. Um, in contrast to Freud, I continue to make eye contact with the patient, but my hand goes on the page and makes certain notes. And that's especially important. I mean, I, when I was younger, I had a really good memory so I could remember so much of the session and when the patient left then i'd make notes uh, now i i do it and patients right away want to know well who's going to read the notes and what are you doing and mm. and they just get used to it once in a blue moon someone says this is uh disturbing to me it's distracting i don't want you to take notes mm. in the session and then i don't period mm. but yeah. most people feel kind of grateful that you care enough that mm. you want to get the details so that in the next session when they say you know, my husband went for tests. You don't say what tests because uh -huh. you wrote down that he was going to have a cardio workout, right? Mm, so, yeah. Um, yeah. And, mm. uh, and of course, dreams and little bits of stuff about fantasy and, and transference. So, yes, I read the dialogue in the book is reconstructed. Okay. Okay. That's all. Okay. And then um, you mentioned recently you, you released Schopenhauer's Parcupines on Audible and you were able to do the reading yourself. And what was it like for you kind of revisiting it after all these years and, and doing the reading and yeah. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, huh. but you know, but I also thought, um, Oh, that sentence is awkward. I really uh -huh. would like to rewrite <laughs> that. And, uh, what is that adverb doing there? You uh -huh. know, um, mostly that, that I wished I'd had another year to hmm. just make the prose hmm. shimmer and shine. And, um, and, and just between you and me, when I was reading it, I did throw out an occasional awkward phrase. I just didn't read it if I thought it was, <laughs> was it well written. Okay. Well, if it's any consolation, I think, um, we, we, you know, we can always, we can always look back and find how we could have done better, especially, you know, with all of our new knowledge and experience, but uh, it's very much a joy to read and it's very enthralling and regardless of if you used maybe a poor adverb every now and again. <laughs> um, Thank you. Well, all three of my books are written on typewriters. You see, they proceeded. Oh. Yeah. So now it's easier to make corrections. So in yeah. my defense, yeah. <laughs> you'll, you'll have to write a new book with, uh, yeah, with a computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, and earlier, you mentioned in family therapy that especially like from the object relations um a lot of it you you've turned the focus you know to each individual and do you really want to you know maybe how were you raised and are you raising your child maybe the same way that you were raised and is that really what you want to do and in the book you mentioned i'm probably going to pronounce this very poorly but uh vider hollingswang Vider Hollenswang okay. or right, repetition compulsion? <laughs> Vida, Vida Hollenswang. Vida Let's Hollenswang. Let's break it down. You've heard of Vida Zayn. Uh -huh. Vida means again. Vida Zayn. See you again. 
So okay. Zwang, Z W A N G, means oh. impulse in German. Oh. Okay. So wieder holen Zwang is the impulse to do it again. Oh. And what we say is the 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 compulsion to repeat or oh. the repetition compulsion. Okay. So okay. Freud, yes, in okay. uh, in a book called Beyond the Pleasure Principle, talks about the repetition compulsion. And even though it sounds like a fancy concept, we all have asked ourselves, why do I keep doing this? Hmm. And people ask themselves, why do I keep having the same relationship? You know, I get in with someone who who is too dependent on me or too needy or too angry. Uh, and then I meet someone who seems different, but it's the same relationship. Hmm. So hmm. Freud said there are two reasons we repeat uh, patterns because it's... Um, because they're familiar, it's just in our bones, it's what we know. Uh -huh. And the second is to master uh, something. So mm. we keep maybe dating people who are, uh, have a bad temper because we want to uh, work through something we couldn't do in childhood. We could not fix the angry mother or father, but maybe we can tame this mm. fascinating but wild romantic partner. Uh -huh. um, a patient of mine once said that who had a, a ter terribly alcoholic mother, very violent, um, but also beloved, you know, mm -hmm. it was a relationship yeah. without a warmth, except when, when the mom was drinking. And um, this was, had been such a struggle for the young woman, the child growing up. So you think she'd want to get away from drinkers altogether, mm -hmm. but she always found herself um, falling in love. Mm. with heavy drinkers mm. and the way she expressed it was there is this um undying wish to be kissed by someone with alcohol on their breath mm. remembering the childhood you know yeah. kiss good night so i like that because it's so physical it's so um immediate you know mm -hmm. that association so yeah whatever we knew in childhood is kind of imprinted on us and we go we continue wittingly or not to, to seek out those patterns and we can change them. Yes. But only with great effort. We always, if we want to change something that's been a habit that goes back to childhood and sometimes goes back many generations, mm. we really have to focus very hard and psychodynamic therapy is one way to do that. There are other ways, you know, yeah. <laughs> people choose other paths, but that's one way. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so going in, so so from there, uh, you were talking uh, Don Juan, I think from Triton, right? Uh -huh. Yep. He, um, you mentioned when he was around five years old, he mentioned that he mentioned that when he was around five years old, he would go in and sleep in the bed with his mother, and his father was kind of a recluse, and it was kind of evident that his mother preferred him over his father, uh -huh. and. Can you kind of explain what kind of a psychological impact that might have on the son of sure. a relationship? So like I want to be clear, that was not an abusive situation. It was just a kid cuddling up with, with his mom. Okay. And, um, and, and the point of that was not just that he was in bed with his mom. A lot of kids do that. Yeah. It was that he felt, he realized throughout his childhood that his mom uh, seemed to like his company. That the dad was so introverted and always up in his uh, study working. In fact, they refer to him as, quote, our father who art upstairs. Mm. Yeah. Uh -huh. Always, he was a physician and always preoccupied, never had time to, you know, just would eat quickly with the family, eat dinner and then run back upstairs. Okay. So from a young age, the mother found a better interlocutor, a better conversation partner in the little boy, he mm. was lively, he was present and grateful and a lot of fun, kept mom company. And then as he got older was, yeah, more interesting and interested. And so there, you know, we call that an edible victory because okay. um, in general, children should uh, try and um, um, be playful and get next to, get close to um, one parent or the other and say, things kids say like uh, when I grew up I want to marry mommy or I want to marry daddy uh -huh. that's all normal it's healthy it's you know it's a kind of uh, discovery that you can make somebody special to you mm. um, and the parents shouldn't be shocked or freaked out by that they should lovingly indicate to the child yes you're very important to me 
I adore you and love you and I love every part of you, body and soul, but you can't marry me because I'm married to this guy, get it? Mm -hmm. And um, and when you grow up, then you'll have your own. And uh, so um, that's the what we call, what Freud called the normal resolution of the Oedipus complex. The child comes to grips with the fact that he or she can't win one parent away from the other, that they, the, the bond is strong. And, uh, but there are kids who are edible victors, but that victory is, we say a pyrrhic victory, meaning not worth it, uh -huh. <laughs> meaning a victory that is actually a defeat. Uh -huh. Because if you were able at five years old to get one parent away from the other, um, you are going to grow up typically with a kind of inflated self-esteem, mm. you know, that's not helpful. Um, and that uh, makes you feel you're always better than all your rivals. Um, uh, you know, it can have a, a number of bad consequences. Mm. I mean, Oedipal victors also can grow up to be very revolutionary because they were never cowed by authority. They were never put in their place. Mm. It's not like anything else, you know. Uh -huh. um, there's, a, there's always a positive and negative side. But yeah, and, th and then a lot of feminists around, fem family therapists around the 70s and 80s were saying, the reason that women, you know, prefer their sons and kind of marry their sons is because they can't get the same thing out of out of the men. And if the men would just get a little bit more emotionally available, mm. that that uh, phenomenon wouldn't happen. And uh, what it what it can result in is the sense of grandiosity in the mm. little boy that he can be a womanizer and just win any woman he can. And in the case of Don Juan from mm literature this is this is a character that goes back to the 15th century spanish epic and is repeated in many uh byron wrote a long poem called Don Juan, and um uh and uh george bernard shaw wrote uh, a play about don juan and it's a you know it's a theme oh uh, mozart wrote don giovanni giovanni is the italian word for john juan uh -huh. so don giovanni is just the story of don juan uh -huh. and um uh, you know, the theme is always that there's this guy who has hundreds of lovers and can't love anybody. It's just compulsive, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, Freud would say that tendency, which is can be fun and exhilarating. Of course, there's that side, uh, but uh, can can really also be very destructive, depressing, unsatisfying. Ultimately, Freud would say that goes back to this particular constellation in childhood. Uh, OK, OK, OK. Um, and, and, uh, you, I, I wanted to know, so, um, Pearl, you mentioned her sciatic pain and that was you, there was a running theory that that helped her kind of relate to her mother, uh, as they were separated and living in different places and, uh, a bunch of, bunch of factors there, but did uh, through therapy, did Pearl's sciatic pain ever kind of dissipate or go away? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, um, as Freud would say, either we talk or the body talks for us. Mm. So in this case, it's definitely that her, her neck and back had joined the conversation when she mm. was under stress. It, uh, she would be in excruciating pain as her mother had, had been. Now, of course, there's some thing as uh, somatic vulnerability. You know, you uh -huh. can be born with all of us have a, a little weakness somewhere. But um, the fact that it was, she identified it with her mother uh, was in a weird and of course unconscious way reassuring because mm -hmm. her mom had been uh, very poor. She was, the, huh, I talk about, I'm the first in the family to go to college, but my, my parents were solid working class, but she came from real poverty, mm -hmm. you know, from abject poverty. So, and then ended up as a, an academic in an Ivy League type school i mean i've changed the, the details of course yeah, about yeah. her all that but um uh so to go from you know to make such a leap not in five generations but in one gave her a lot of survivor's guilt that's a mm. very important concept um the the feeling that you can't really enjoy your success because the folks back home never got to do that or the ones who perished you know, in slavery or in the Holocaust, how can you be mm. dancing on air about the fact that you got this degree or this title 
um, when yeah. it was on the backs of people who suffered greatly. So for her to at least feel that she was still this this uh, suffering black woman, you know, like mm. her mom, uh-huh. was it was a bond for them. It, it it was a way of bringing herself down a peg. But as we talked through it, she relaxed and was not so tormented mm. with the sciatica. Wow. It reminds me, I've, I was recently reading The Undiscovered Self by Carl Jung, and uh-huh. he mentioned he was uh, on, a, on the topic of dreams, and dreams are symbolism, but he also talked about, he said long ago, Freud recognized that our body talks in symbolis, uh, symbolism just as our dreams do, yeah, and so I always find that so fascinating, and, and I remember reading about how a psychotherapy, you know, people you can cure migraines and and sciatic pain and all these different things. And so that's just fascinating to me. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um, and then, yeah. So Lacan, uh, the French psychoanalyst. Uh-huh. Um, L-A-C-A-N. We should tell your, your listeners. Okay. L-A-C-A-N. Jacques Lacan. L-A-C-A-N. Yeah. Okay. He, um, I have never personally tried to read him. I have heard that he is very difficult to understand and to read. And I've even heard some people say that, you know, he is, they were, they were weary of how complex he is. And they said, usually if they're that complex, then they're not, they're not being forthright for a reason. Um, so that's that one, that one side of it, but I was wondering how, so you briefly mentioned earlier, getting interested in him and you wrote that um, the companion to Lacan and you co- I wrote one chapter you wrote one chapter yes yeah, sorry <laughs> um so what was it like for you learning about him and reading his works and have you always kind of maybe felt it easier to understand him or was that a long journey to understand him or can you tell us about that well yeah that's that's not a hard question to answer so i remember uh-huh. back in buffalo when i was studying psychoanalysis and literature uh-huh. um jacques lacan's name came up and he was very 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 trendy at the time. And here's what was appealing about him. Mm -hmm. Uh, He said that psychoanalysis in America Mm -hmm. and in other parts of the world, and and to some extent in France, was was really, uh, had been ruined, had been um, uh, changed in a bad way, Mm -hmm. and uh, that we needed to return to the original mission. Uh And one thing he said was, uh, the medicalization of psychoanalysis was a disaster and Lacan was dead right. So remember mm. when I said Freud had uh-huh. said the worst possible training, right? So guess what the American group decided to do way back in the forties or fifties, only medical doc. Not only would it be a good way, it would be the only way. Mm. And I can't tell you how grotesque the situation was because mm. not only could PhDs and social workers not even apply, uh-huh. but that w- what they would do would be to on the sly, by hours of supervision and not be, and have to lie about it. Mm. And those medical doctors who were analysts who were teaching them psychoanalytic ideas would have been in real trouble. It would have been a scandal, you mm. know, if it had been discovered. Uh-huh. So that didn't end until they, they had to bring a lawsuit and people spent decades of their lives and lots of money, a lawsuit in 1986. That's how recent it is. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that said that, and, and they used the laws against racketeering, believe it or not. And finally, uh, the American psychoanalytic had to relent and accept non, non-medical analysts. Wow. I know yeah, so just- Theodore Reich, he was one of the first, he founded the Institute in New York. Was he one of the first psychoanalysts that did not have a medical degree? Uh-huh. That sounds uh-huh. right. I don't okay. know who the actual first was, but okay. yeah, and Anna Freud did not, of course. But it, but you see, um, in Freud's group, he accepted. Mm, yeah, yeah, know, yeah. It, it was interesting that remember that the um, the uh, wisdom, so called, of my uh-huh. psych professors that Freud was not worth listening to because he hated women, mm. and uh, but the point was that he had brilliant. You know, he sort of. Um, encouraged his daughter, not his uh-huh. son, to follow him in the family business. Yeah. And he had women around him like Lou Andrea Salome and Jean Lampel de Boot and Helena Deutsch. He very much encouraged women to mm. become psychoanalysts and respected them a lot and did whatever he could. Mm. Uh, in contrast to 
in the psychology department <laughs> in Buffalo in the 70s, there wasn't one woman. And yet, wow. yeah, so that was just so, um, you know, quite a, a, a paradox there. So, uh -huh. um, yes, yeah, so Jacques Lacan uh -huh. said that what had happened in America was just dreadful, mm -hmm. that in Freud's name, in the name of being Freudian, they had mm -hmm. developed this practice of only MDs and that it had consequences. It wasn't just about excluding some people um, because Freud, what Freud did was to call into question um, all social and sexual norms. And, uh, and so he was a, a revolutionary, whereas the American group um, had turned psychoanalysis into just a, another conservative medical specialty and very mm -hmm. expensive mm -hmm. because Freud had free clinics. There were seven free clinics in his oh. day and Freud was, oh, you didn't know about that. No. Yeah, Freud was prouder of the free clinics than anything else. So write down this title. A friend of mine wrote a book. Her last name is Elizabeth Danto, D-A-N-T-O, came out in 2005. And the title is Freud's Free Clinics. Okay. Psychoanalysis and Social Justice, 1918 to 1938. I know, imagine this is this glorious chapter of our history is completely subjugated. I mean, people just uh, it got forgotten about, uh -huh. but he was, Freud was so, so proud. And um, so everybody uh, had access, farmers and factory workers and chambermaids and uh -huh. the unemployed were able to get psychoanalysis. And then the Nazis uh, changed all that. That's how it ended in 36 when they, when they burned Freud's books. So back to America, um, uh, instead of this revolutionary practice, highly intellectual kind of proto-feminist, you know, um, no. Instead, the, these white male doctors turn psychoanalysis into, um, into a kind of a, a very normative thing. Mm. And so the goal was to turn, you know, people into um, good businessmen and women. You mm. know, it wasn't yeah. about uh, self-examination. It was about uh, adapting. It was about adapting to uh, norms, which, you know, cultural norms can be uh, very oppressive, especially uh -huh. at the time. Uh -huh. So analysts were indeed, you know, engaged in trying to talk gay people into being straight again. It was very much pathologized, mm. anything that wasn't, um, wasn't normal about gender. Mm. So yeah, so Jacques Lacan just uh, was, was right in, in, in saying this is a terrible scandal. We have mm. to... Um, we have to go back to the original Freud and really see what he was talking about. He, and and uh, Lacan also thought that the Americans were, were very anti-intellectual and that that was a disaster. And he, he said famously, is it so much to ask of analysts that they be literate? <laughs> and so, you know, he had me at, right there, right? Yeah, yeah. So he was born, so his dates are something like 1900 to 1981. He's dead now, but he was going to rewrite psychoanalysis. And he used some, you know, there's a French tradition of writing in a kind of very elevated, intellectual, um, dense way. Mm. And so if you have read, uh, if you've read Claude Lévi-Strauss or if you read Michel Foucault, then Jacques Derrida, then you're used to at least struggling with text. Mm. So, um, and I had done a little bit of that, again, as a result of, hanging out in the English department. I was a little more used to struggling with text. And also uh, I'm, I'm fluent in French. Thanks again oh. to the Sisters of Notre Dame at my, at Regina High School of Cleveland. Um, I owe that to them. So I was, and then I went to, to France one summer to study at Lacan School. It was just a month, very intensive, Ooh, wow. six days a week, eight hours, you know, and then when our, our uh, seminars were over, we would go out to dinner together and talk about Lacan all night. It was, <laughs> it was very intense. That sounds so, so fun. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I learned a lot. I think he has some wonderful ideas. I am no longer in love, I would say, with, with Lacan, <laughs> but I learned a, a tremendous amount. Mm. I would never call myself a Lacanian, but I think he's, um, you know, really um, extremely important. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, you would find, if you picked up... Uh, is a key you would you might find it absolutely impenetrable so you might want to start with a, a secondary source um, bruce fink is the american who has tried to make lacan more more readable hmm. it sounds it sounds like you very much uh resonated with how he said is 
is the American psycho, is it so much to ask that they be uh, literate, right? And yeah. you were you were like in search of that through school, and you were like, I thought these people were going to be articulate and literate, and here. So it sounds like you very much resonated with that. Oh my really, goodness, he was. Yeah. I felt he was speaking right to me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I thought it interesting. So in a, in a way, um, I was going to move into talking. So. I'm going to introduce Project Hope real quick, or Project Home, oh, sorry. sorry, Project Home and Insight for All. So um, so for those who don't know, Project Home is an organization that was started in the 1980s by two best friends, Joan Dawson McConnell and Mary Scullion, a nun. Uh, they, it provides housing opportunities for employment, medical care, and education for homeless people. And Dr. Lutnitz met with Sister Mary back in 2005 to discuss what her and the psychoanalytic community could do in order to serve Project Home's residents, which led to the development of Insight for All. And so as you talk about this, I was thinking about, you know, I did not know before this conversation, Freud's um, free, the free... Yeah, the free clinics and how he was a big advocate for that and for you said doing a uh, psychotherapy for the you know the poor and the homeless and that and so in a very much in a very much sense you are carrying on that tradition so can you kind of tell us about insight for all and and sure. how the, yeah i'd love to yeah well in the 1980s philly had one of the highest rates of homelessness in the nation and now we have one of the lowest rates in the nation mm. and the progress that we still have work to do but that transformation is due to those two women, Sister Mary Scullion and her friend, Joan Bassa McConnell. So oh. they started, they had no funding, no grants, no training. They weren't social workers. Or they were just outraged at the plight of the very poor mm. in the world's wealthiest nation. So they took over an abandoned recreation center <laughs> in South Philly and invited 50 homeless men to come in. And what could they do? They gave them soup, sandwiches, blankets, conversation, and six months later, they, they were all turned out. But at least for that one winter, mm. nobody died of frostbite. Yeah. Mm. So when that little fledgling thing ended, the community stepped forward and said, don't stop. We want to help. Mm. And they started donating money and taught them how to get grants. So um, uh, and, the, and some lawyers came forward and said, we will you're going to have trouble, legal troubles if you try and oh. uh, implement something for the homeless. And we are going to defend you pro bono. Oh. Wow. For as long as it takes, and they did, and they did. Oh. So um, now, fast forward 30 years, um, this thing is, it's known all over the world, Project Home. So there are, it consists of 18 freestanding apartment buildings all over mm. the city that homeless people never have to leave. Mm. So, wow. and that's the answer. It's not about building more and more shelters. I've, I've been to cities where the, the shelters are just beautiful. They've got everything, but you can only stay 30 days. Uh. So if you're homeless because your house burnt down or something, uh -huh. you know, or you missed a paycheck or something, okay, that's fine. But if you're homeless because you have an addiction or a mental illness, you need a lot more help and a lot more time. Hmm. So this is permanent housing, apartments, with wow. full, you know, fully staffed. And, um, and there is, um, you know, you can take art classes and GED classes, and um, there's an advocacy department that helps people, first of all, register to vote, but also take part in community protests and uh, you know and yeah. get involved yeah. in the political process so um wow. yeah it's just you know everybody loves project home so um they asked me it was way back 1999 um there had been a fire in one of the residences and people were traumatized so would i help run a group hmm. for the residents so i did one group led to another and i finally sat down in 2005 with sister marion and asked her if i point blank could i bring this psychoanalytic therapy to Project Home. Could I develop a, uh, a program? And she had a lot of good questions. She's very, very smart. Now I thought, of course, based on my high school experience that I could, you know, I could talk a nun into anything. <laughs> you get, you know, get a certain yeah. amount of practice. Yeah. <laughs> but she was, um, no, she's tough. Very, very smart and mm. fair-minded, but had big questions about what is this? Uh, Freud? I mean, wasn't he all about rich people and, uh, is this really for us? And is it evidence-based? Because, you know, mm. everyone knows that term now. Uh -huh. So luckily, those questions were not hard to answer. There's an enormous evidence base for psychoanalysis at this point. Yeah. Thanks especially to Jonathan Shedler and his work. And, um, uh, and, and I was able to give her a copy of 
Danto's book, Freud's Free Clinics. It's the kind of book where as soon as you read the title, you've learned something. Wait uh-huh, a minute. Uh-huh. I didn't know that they were free clinics. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So she was impressed. And then I had to kind of follow through because I was acting like, sure, I can, I have this group in mind and it's <laughs> going to materialize. So I had to, you know, sort of pretend it was working before I had uh, established it. And then just uh, tapped friends one at a time saying, could you see one pa- one homeless patient? Could you run one group? Mm. And now there are about a dozen of us. And um, we do several things. We do run groups. And we have one. Well, I mentioned her. The, this is Violet Little, who is, um, she and I are going to write Freud and Jesus together. Oh, okay. she, all right. So she is our analyst on the street. Oh. She sees only people mm. who haven't come indoors. And she sees some people once in a while. And she sees other three times a week. This woman is brilliant. And she says she could not do the work if she had not had her full psychoanalytic training. Mm. You have to understand transference and countertransference mm. or you burn out and you don't really reach the person where they are. Mm. Um, so, so she does that. And then the second thing is running groups. And the third thing is what most of us do is individual. It's not classical analysis four times a week uh-huh. on the couch. It's once or twice a week sitting up. And uh, we've had just some wonderful outcomes, Daniel. It's just, you know, um, and uh, so we're, um, this year finishes 16 years of insight for all, because my motto is um, if (laughs) from the beginning, if this project lasts, it'll be great. (laughs) (laughs) If we make it past one year, you know, because we were, there are no books that say, here's how you do psychotherapy with homeless people. Um, We were teaching ourselves as we went. Okay, so one of my questions was I was going to ask you, um, moving moving forward, do you have any any new ideas for books? And I kind of teased you about it earlier, but have you thought about writing a book on on how to do psychoanalytic treatment with homeless population, or do you I'm think that sure would? I have just... another, I'm not sure I have another book in me, although I love doing creative writing, so uh-huh. I'm I'm hoping. Uh-huh. Uh, in retirement, uh, if that ever happens, to do more writing of short stories, for example. Okay. Um, but uh, but in terms of professional writing, I think at some point I will write one. I've written short articles uh-huh. um, and a book chapter about our work with the homeless. And at some point I'll, okay. I'll have to write one long kind of culminating article uh-huh. that talks about everything we've learned about uh-huh. um, serving this particular wonderful population yeah you could do a book and you could write a chapter of it and then have your friends write chapters and you know <laughs> yes that's called an edited book yeah, okay. yeah. You, you have to have friends who like writing and that's um, not a, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people just don't for me it's um you know uh, writing takes care of me it's a mm. it's, it's a holding environment i can kind of disappear into it mm. uh and some people, for for them, writing is the enemy, and it's just not pleasant. Mm, it's yeah. I think it just it, writing is a language. You know how you if you start a foreign language uh, when you're they say before the age of fourteen or something, you you really get it. And you won't uh-huh. have a strong accent. Uh-huh. Um, and if you learn it later in life, it always feels like you're um, you know sort of reading yeah. on the Facebook. Well, writing is its own kind of language, and if mm. you start young, it will feel like it's part of you. So once again, shout out to the nuns of uh, the sisters of Notre Dame. Oh. Boy, do they push us to write. Oh my God. Yeah. I pulled more, more all nighters in high school than at any other time in my life. Wow. Well, that seems like are, a... I guess it's, I keep talking about high school. It probably sounds strange to your listeners, but this coming fall is our 50th um, anniversary oh. of graduating high school. So we're having a reunion in October. In oh, that's so fun. So, it's fresh in my mind. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to ask. Uh, so through our correspondence, you mentioned uh, working with, with Insight for All. You mentioned the idea that you, you cited Campbell, I think, uh, 2006. You mentioned the idea that the first home we inhabit is the mother's body. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about that idea and how it plays out while working with people who are homeless? Sure. That's actually, she got that from Freud. Okay. Uh, in his essay on the Heimlich, on the Uncanny, he says the first home we inhabit is the mother's body. And Donald Winnicott, whose name hasn't come up yet, 
who is a big, big influence on me more than anyone except Freud, um, said, let's really focus on that early relationship. Freud got interested at the point of the Oedipus complex, which is three to five, but he doesn't have much to say about children between zero and three. He said, mm. I'm going to count on analysts of the future to fill in this gap. And maybe the women analysts, since a lot of them are mothers, will be really helpful in, in filling this in. Well, okay. Donald Winnicott, uh, was, well, his, his, uh, his daughter, Anna Freud, did um, a lot of work, and that will be called the pre edible area, the, the first years, but, um, uh, and worked with children. Mm. And Winnicott was a, was a big influence. So we say the, the first home we inhabit is the mother's body, and ideally that's a time when all our needs are met. Mm. And so um, the, uh, it becomes a template for other homes. So every home we inhabit, um, from you know uh, in adulthood, for example, your ability to have a home as a grown up is uh, influenced by the home you were able to have just before that, mm. and ultimately your all your childhood homes all the way back to the mother's body, right? Mm. So, um, uh, but what if what if it wasn't a time of bliss? You know, we say, oh, it's like returning to the womb. Being on vacation was like returning to the womb. We mean uh. this time of perfect nirvana. But what if it, what if the mother was hungry? What if the mm. preg pregnant mother was being um, was on drugs or being punched in the stomach? Mm. Then that first tome was was a chamber of horrors, and mm. every future enclosure, every future home will be will reverberate with those primitive agonies. Mm. And so it's uh, thinking in this way helps us get compassion for homeless people we on we see on the street who seem to be lost and wandering and um, there are folks who are called shelter resistant because they don't want to come indoors mm. but it can be terrifying for people um, to to think of going into a dormitory where there are 36 beds because usually your entry level shelter is not an apartment a project home you're in a shelter for a temporary um, period of time but the idea of being you know if you're a little paranoid to go into a group with all those bodies yeah. and rules and things some people find they actually would prefer to be out in the park, mm. that their mind feels, you know, if you have an unhoused mind, you are not happy about being indoors. So, so thinking developmentally and psychoanalytically helps us gain compassion for that experience. And what we do in, the, in terms of Winnicott, this British analyst that I've been mentioning, um, is we provide a holding environment for all our patients. You know, the mother provides an atmosphere of safety and trust for the baby. And the therapist does that for the patient. Yeah. Um, and um, so, but how do you provide a holding environment for someone who's never been held before? Mm. It has to be done very, very carefully. So at first, when the therapist in my group would, um, would offer to say, okay, here's, a, and here's an appointment for the homeless person living at Project Home, they, there would be a lot of no-shows. Mm. because it was so disruptive to think of just getting an address and having to scout out the this doctor's office when you, you know, this person uh -huh. you never met. Uh -huh. And homeless people are not used to good service, so they didn't think people would really notice if mm. anybody didn't show up. And so often they're sent to agencies, and agencies sometimes, you know, they're very wonderful people who work in community mental health, but... Um, they have been probably told that uh, homeless people aren't going to show up. And so they don't expect them to show up and they don't go the extra mile, which gives the communication to the homeless person mm. that I'm not really wanted here. I'm going to see a new person every time I show up at this clinic, if I uh -huh. do show up on the right day. So it's a vicious cycle, you see. Mm. The one thing keeps influencing the other in a, in a bad way. So I wondered if we could break that vicious, make it a virtuous cycle by uh, changing the, the meeting place. So I asked my therapist to please all go down and meet the patient at Project oh. Home at their oh. building, say in some empty office. Uh -huh. Now that, that um, demands a lot more of the therapist. Obviously mm, you can't yeah. see a paying patient in the hour before or after your homeless patient, uh -huh. um, but it worked. It worked. Oh, good. So yeah, they'd cut no shows down to almost zero. And so we start there and, um, then we wait for the patient to say, we build a relationship uh -huh. and build some trust and then wait for the patient to say, wait a minute, where's your office? Why don't, who gets to go there? 
and then it's okay here's where it is would you know how to get there let's talk about it it's a, it's a big step ah. but once it happens it always the therapy always deepens mm, that's exciting that's yeah that's a pivotal moment right yeah. yeah yeah good that's exciting um i think well, that's all the questions i had for you i i want to say again it's an honor and a pleasure and i'm very humbled that you took the time to meet with me and I very much enjoyed this conversation. I've learned a lot. And um, I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. I enjoyed it very much.